We have spent the last couple of videos examining the role that partisan revolutions played in party competition in 19th century Latin America. We saw that this type of civil war was common throughout Spanish America, and partisan revolutions were the most common way that opposition parties gained presidential power. However, partisan revolutions were conspicuously absent from Brazil during this period. Brazil does see some secessionist conflicts similar to the ones in countries like Mexico and New Granada, but 19th century Brazil was able to avoid Spanish America's cycle of conflict between two opposing parties for control over the national government. In this video, we are going to take a look at some of the reasons why Brazil was spared this sort of partisan violence. This will provide us with a convenient excuse to check in on what has been happening in Brazil in the 19th century, and it will also help shed light on some of the structural and institutional factors that made partisan conflict so much more common in Spanish America. I am going to argue that the main reason why Brazil is able to avoid partisan revolutions was because it had a political system that facilitated bipartisan power sharing in a way that most Spanish American countries did not. Unlike in Spanish America, opposition elites in Brazil are able to trust that they will eventually get their turn to govern as long as they are patient and they play by the rules in the meantime. And this obviates the need for the opposition to ever seize power through force in Brazil. The key institutional difference between Brazil and Spanish America after independence was that every Spanish American country became a presidential republic, while Brazil remained a parliamentary monarchy throughout most of the 19th century. Brazil is the only monarchy in Latin America that lasts for more than a decade. Under a presidential republic, power is divided between separate executive and legislative branches that are both elected by voters. The leader of the executive branch, the president, also serves as both the head of state and the head of government. But under a parliamentary monarchy, the head of state and the head of government are two separate people, the monarch and the prime minister, respectively. Neither figure is directly elected by the people, and the people vote only for a member of parliament to represent them, though the prime minister is supposed to be accountable to the parliament in some way. In parliamentary democracies nowadays, the prime minister and the cabinet are chosen by the parliament, so voters have at least an indirect say in who the prime minister will be. Though historically, the prime minister would be appointed at the discretion of the monarch, and this was still the case in countries like the German Empire, the Kingdom of Italy, and Brazil in the 19th century. The reason why a monarchy survives in Brazil was due to the rather unusual way that Brazil's War of Independence played out during the 1820s. During the Napoleonic invasion of Portugal in 1807, the Portuguese royal family had taken refuge in Brazil, and they remained in Rio de Janeiro even after the Napoleonic Wars were over. As a result, the Portuguese royal family was still physically present in Brazil when the War of Independence breaks out in 1822 and the crown prince Pedro is able to salvage the situation by becoming the leader of the independence movement that is directed against his own father, King Joao IV of Portugal. And Pedro ends up getting crowned as emperor of a fully independent empire of Brazil. Not everyone in Brazil wants to be part of this highly centralized empire, and there are various secessionist conflicts and regional revolts during the 1820s. Though in the end, only Spanish-speaking Uruguay is able to break away from Brazil permanently. Nevertheless, Emperor Pedro has become weary from all of this opposition to his rule, and he finally abdicates the throne in frustration in 1831. 
But this abdication does not lead to a republic. Instead, the throne passes to his five-year-old son, Pedro II, or Pedro II. Brazil's constitutional system stabilizes during the young emperor's minority, and by the time that Pedro II reaches adulthood, the conflicts that marred his father's reign are largely over. All of the major players accept their role in Brazil's constitutional order. The regional powers accept that they are now part of this centralized Brazilian monarchy. The parliament accepts that Brazil's constitution grants the monarch considerable powers. And Emperor Pedro II accepts that Brazil is a constitutional monarchy and there are serious constitutional constraints that limit what he is allowed to do. The Constitution of 1824 explicitly describes the emperor as the poder moderador, the moderating power. The emperor's constitutional role is to maintain a balance between all of the other actors in Brazil's political system. The emperor is basically a referee who is supposed to stay above the fray and serve as a nonpartisan and impartial higher authority who can resolve political disputes and keep the other branches of government working together. And Pedro II takes this idea of the poder moderador to heart, and he makes it the mission of his reign to diffuse conflict in Brazil's political system. A good example of one of the ways the Emperor Pedro does this is through the selection of prime minister. Under the 1824 constitution, the parliament can dismiss the prime minister through a vote of no confidence, but the emperor has broad discretion in choosing who the new prime minister will be. Brazil has two political parties at this time, a liberal party and a conservative party, and Emperor Pedro is careful to alternate the position of prime minister between the two parties on a fairly regular basis in order to ensure that each party gets its fair chance to govern. This largely eliminates any need for a partisan revolution in Brazil because the opposition party knows that its turn will come around eventually and it only needs to wait for the emperor to swap out the parties and government again. Moreover, trying to seize power early through a revolution would be completely counterproductive because Emperor Pedro is not going to reward politicians who resort to such behavior by making them prime minister. Pedro II wants everyone else in the political system to play by the rules and get along with each other, And the way that you become prime minister under this system is to prove to the emperor that you are a team player. This leads to a second difference in how Brazil's parties govern that contrasts sharply with the situation in Spanish America. In a conventional Westminster-style parliamentary system like the one in Britain, the prime minister would draw support mainly from his own political party. So if the prime minister is a conservative, the legislative majority that keeps him in office would normally come only from the conservative party. But in Brazil during this era, we see prime ministers form very broad legislative majorities that include members of both the conservative and liberal parties. This is because Brazil's political system gives the prime minister an incentive to work with members from the opposition party. The prime minister is the leader of one of the two parties, and he needs to keep his own party happy as well. But he ultimately depends on the emperor's support for his job. And Pedro II wants a prime minister who has broad support in parliament and who is able to cooperate with the other party. In some cases, prime ministers in Brazil end up leading a grand coalition government that includes both parties in the cabinet. But even when the cabinet consists of only one party, the prime minister still goes out of his way to bring the other party on board by offering them patronage. Over time, this cooperation between the two parties leads the liberal and conservative parties to become ideologically muddled and much more moderate than their Spanish-American counterparts. <laughs> 
as we are going to see in the next video, Spanish American liberals are about to enact some sweeping structural reforms. But Brazilian liberals do not want any of that. They are content with the slower pace of reform in Brazil, and they actually end up to the right of Emperor Pedro II on several key political issues. The conservatives in most Spanish American countries are these authoritarian reactionary coalitions, but Brazilian conservatives are also quite moderate in comparison. They like the fact that Brazil still has a monarchy, but the monarch in question is a pretty liberal guy. So Brazilian conservatives are often pressured to go along with reforms that Spanish American conservatives would have rejected out of hand. So to summarize some of the key differences between Brazil and Spanish American countries, first, Brazil has a nonpartisan head of state, the emperor, who is able to play an important role as a peacemaker in the political system. This contrasts with the president in Spanish American countries, who is always going to be a partisan actor who is mostly loyal to his own political party. As we saw in the previous video, power-sharing arrangements in countries like Colombia and Uruguay often fell apart because the party that held the presidency always had the power to renege on the power-sharing deal unilaterally. And there was no higher authority who could enforce the bargain. This is not an issue in Brazil because Emperor Dom Pedro is that higher authority. He is the person that the other actors in Brazil can turn to in order to resolve their disputes. A second important difference between Brazil and Spanish America is how opposition parties come to power. We saw before that opposition parties in Spanish America normally had to resort to revolution in order to take power because elections were always stacked in favor of the incumbent party. Elections are not much cleaner in Brazil either, but Brazil's constitutional system provides for a much cleaner and more peaceful way for the opposition party to take power. Namely, the emperor dismisses the current prime minister and he appoints a new prime minister from the other party. In Spanish America, you become president by investing in your party's military capabilities. But in Brazil, you become prime minister by showing the emperor that you are a team player who is willing to get along with the other party. This in turn fosters a much greater degree of cooperation across party lines than we see in Spanish America during this time. And Brazil's parties themselves become very moderate, and this further reduces the stage of party competition in Brazil. Now, Brazil is not a democracy at this time. Elections are still highly controlled by local elites, and elections ultimately have very little effect on which party holds power. But Brazil's unique political system does provide for a degree of political stability and economic prosperity that was very rare in the rest of Latin America during the middle decades of the 19th century. Brazil is able to avoid the constant partisan civil wars that are going on throughout Spanish America during these decades. However, this stability does not last forever. The monarchy's base of support among the aristocracy and local elites starts to erode quite rapidly during the 1880s. There were a number of reasons for this, but the most important had to do with the abolition of slavery. By the mid-1880s, Brazil is the only country in the Western world where chattel slavery is still legal. Most of the people in the royal family consider themselves abolitionists, including Emperor Pedro I and Emperor Pedro II. But they were hesitant to do much of anything about slavery out of fear that this would be viewed as monarchical overreach and a violation of the Constitution. Under Brazil's Constitution, such matters were supposed to be the prerogative of Parliament, and Parliament was filled with a bunch of slave-owning aristocrats 
who wanted slavery to remain legal. However, in 1887, Pedro Segundo travels to Europe for medical treatment, and he leaves his daughter and heir apparent, Princess Isabel, to govern as regent. Isabel does not share her father's hesitation about intervening in the legislative process for the purpose of abolishing slavery, and she puts together a new cabinet that is filled with abolitionists. And in 1888, the princess and the cabinet strong arm the parliament into finally abolishing slavery in Brazil. This has the effect of alienating many of the plantation owning aristocrats who had formed a core base of support for the monarchy throughout all of these years. These aristocrats are furious that they now have to free their slaves without receiving any monetary compensation, and they make it clear to Pedro Segundo upon his return to Brazil later that year that they are never going to accept Isabel as empress after Pedro dies. Many of these plantation owners also flock to Brazil's growing republican movement. They are convinced that the monarchy has betrayed them, and they now want the monarchy gone. A year later, in 1889, Brazil's monarchy is overthrown in a republican military coup. This coup does not have very broad support in Brazilian society, but it succeeds at toppling the monarchy mostly because the royal family decides not to fight it. They do not want there to be a civil war between royalists and republicans, and so they agree to go into exile in Europe. Brazil's monarchy comes to an end, and the first Brazilian republic is established. <laughs> 